hang on. And hearing you say that's like, that's exactly what we're doing in small business as well. We're saying to scale or to have more people in our program to make more money. Cause you know, this is why ethical marketing, I think is coming up. Cause we're realizing we can actually have a really sustainable, profitable income and be a decent human being and take care of the environment and community in the right ways. Welcome to Too Legitimate to Quit, instantly actionable small business strategies with a pop culture spin. I am your host, Annie P. Ruggles, and my guest today is the remarkable Rachel Kurzup. Rachel Kurzup is a marketing coach, copywriter, speaker, and teacher. She supports multi-passionate women to build an aligned, ethical, and profitable business without having to choose between their passions, compromise their values, or use unethical marketing tactics. Rachel has helped over 3,000 creative entrepreneurs gain financial freedom in their businesses, enabling them to make a positive contribution to the world. All the way around the world on a completely different day, but through the power of the internet. Rachel, I'm so excited to ask you the question, what do small business owners need to focus on this week? They need to stop looking externally for validation and start looking internally. Like, you know, you've got this, like, you know, everything you need to know right now to take action, like stop scrolling for coaches on Instagram and like looking at TikToks and shit, like just stop and go, cool, what do I need in this moment? And actually listen, like, is it a glass of water? Like most of the time I need a glass of freaking water and then I can do the thing. Like what do I actually need right now? Listen to yourself and stop going externally for that answer. Like no one's going to tell you to drink a glass of water on Instagram. I'm sorry. They're just not. No, I do love that quote. I am drinking this very, very weird water that looks like orange soda as we were recording. And I'm like, oh, good. I'm so glad I have water for this because I always love that thing. that's like, dear business owner, you are a houseplant. You need water. And I'm like, I am a houseplant. I'm a fabulous houseplant, but I am a houseplant. <laughs> I need water. I need a little food. I need a lot of rest. I need a little sun and I need to be left the F alone sometimes. Like, yep, houseplant here, straight up. But I love the way that you just tied self-prioritization and self-care to validation in that my relationship with validation is pretty fucked, to be fair. Uh, I'll just tell Not everybody too. that right now, right? But yeah. it's, it's, an, it's an unfolding. I'm getting I'm getting better at it, but it is that external induced dopamine hit instead of me just honoring myself, me just trusting myself, me just having confidence or care for myself. And I I don't think I ever really attached those things before of like, maybe you're craving validation because you need something, but what you need might just be water, sleep. Yeah not working <laughs> you know I know I it's that. like it's like mind-blowing right because during the pandemic yeah. I'm in Melbourne Australia spent a lot of the time um locked down which obviously I know other people did but for a while there Melbourne really liked to just wave the flag around locally and globally about how locked down we truly were um and that's when it really hit me because I could spend hours on the internet and I did. And sometimes it was good connection. Sometimes it was bad connection. Sometimes I bought things I needed. Sometimes I bought things I didn't need. But then I started to realize what I actually need. And I was like, I, I miss the gym. Like I literally miss the gym more than I miss traveling. And I'm like an avid traveler, love traveling, exploring. And I did end up missing that a lot too and connection. But I realized I was literally like scrolling TikTok because I was missing friends and I want to go on an adventure and I was thirsty. And it's like, I'm sorry, the internet is not going to solve that. I need to get off my butt, 
get a glass of water, message a friend, even if it was just like, hey, I'm thinking of you. Do you know what I mean? And then I'll talk to my partner about like a plan that I want to do for travel or I'd look at like photos and that's the, that's what I needed and I felt like a connection and I felt safety and I, and I realized that I was taking some of that into my business because, you know, business and life were one and the same at that time. And I was like, why am I starting to take this and do a business? And I started just scrolling and I'm not a scroller normally, but I was just scrolling and looking for answers. And then I was like, oh my God, I need this. I need that. I need that. And I was like, what am I doing? Like, I do not, it's like, I don't need 60 blue bags. I don't need like 60 courses to tell me how to do it. (laughs) And then I realized you're so right. Like I, my brain needed something else, but because I couldn't get it in the moment, or I'm not used to sitting there and just breathing, figuring out what that was. Again, I was looking for the internet to tell me and the internet wants to sell me stuff, everything, like sell me a lifestyle, sell me a bag, sell me a holiday, sell me what type of water I want to be drinking. It like, it wants to sell me everything. And I was allowing it to sell it to me that I was like, hang on. No. And so I have been unlearning that new behavior that brought some kind of comfort during the pandemic. And I think a lot of us have experienced something similar. I'm unlearning that. And also it's making me think about business and ethics and who am I and what I want to do with my life and like the influence, you know, that we have over people on the internet if they are in those moments. We always have those moments when we're on the internet and we're scrolling. You know, we want to be good humans in that moment and literally say stop and drink a glass of water. Like maybe that should be my next reel. Maybe I should do it. Yes. But, you know, it's so interesting to be in the position where we as businesses and business owners, for good and for ill, are constantly squawked at about content creation. Right. And and for good reasons, too. Right. I'm not dogging the Internet. But, you know, we're constantly supposed to be producing. And one of the big markers of success for people like us is the size of your social network or your social engagement or this or that. And so it is really interesting to be of both minds. A, I need to participate in a real way for the legitimacy and longevity of my business. But also maybe while I'm contributing to this, I should do a video about not doing this right now. Right. It's interesting because we're like, we don't want to feel hypocritical, but both things are true. We need to be present on the Internet and we also need to not be on the damn Internet. Right. Like that's just just both. Yeah. And I think for me, I. I don't know if you've done this recently too, but it's made me, I'm going to be honest, like really conflicted, like as an individual, as a business owner, as a marketer, I'm like, should I be sharing this or shouldn't I be sharing this? And, you know, I have rules in my, you know, my own head and processes where I'm like, well, if I'm in the moment and it's still raw, then I don't share. But then I'm like, yeah, I need to share some content. Should I literally just do a real like, hey, everyone get off the internet, drink water. But I I fulfilled my you know, sharing content. I stayed relevant. I stayed funny. I served my clients. So it ticks all these boxes. And then I'm like, but hang on, aren't I telling them to get off the freaking internet? Like they're on the internet scrolling and it's just telling them to drink water. Like, is this actually useful? And my brain just goes around and around and around. And it's exactly what you said. And I keep coming back to that because it's both answers are valid. Both answers are true. Both answers are right. Both answers can like sway and move in the moment. And there is no you know, definitive answer anymore for a lot of us. We really need to like think hard, but then sometimes thinking hard takes away all the creativity. And sometimes I'm like, fuck it. I'm just going to share it and trust again, trust that I know what I'm doing, that it's going to serve, et cetera, et cetera. And so I feel like there's this really interesting balance. Like how much do we want to overthink this? How much do we want to lean into feeling and doing and what we know to be true? And I still can't work that out, but maybe it's a pendulum and it swings every day and that's okay. Yes, the pendulum is okay, right? It's not pleasant sometimes, but it doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It means you're living a very nuanced experience in a very weird, weird reality and a weird time to be alive, right? I swear, nothing made me learn that question, which I love that you brought up so much. That question of like, why am I posting this? Nothing on earth was a better boot camp for that, for my liberal ass than living through the Trump administration. Now, 
I have people that listen of all political stuff and I have people all around the world. I'm sure Australians are very tired of listening to Americans bitch about Trump. But for me, it's not even about bitching about Trump. There were so many things and there still are so many things like the ongoing incredible gun violence here in the U.S. that every time it happens, because I have every Internet channel available, it feels productive and righteous and and brave and important to rush to the Internet and share my anger or my hot take or my rallying cry or whatever. And and I realized pretty soon into 2016, we weren't even that far into it, that I was like, if I post every time I have a feel feel, I'm not going to have any followers. And more importantly, I'm not going to have any sanity because I'm just going to be leaning in to the feel feels and and throwing away both strategy and my peace of mind in favor of that word you mentioned at the very beginning, validation. That's what I wanted. I wanted other people to be like, yeah, we're angry too. On some level, I wanted trolls to be like, shut up. Like, I don't know why I would want that. But at the time, I just wanted to feel more. I wanted my feeling to be matched. And now I still have... I'm able to still dis- use that discernment when it's something like today is my friend Keisha's birthday and I wanted to post about it on LinkedIn. So I was like, why do I want to do this? And I'm like, because Keisha's my friend. It's her birthday. I haven't posted on LinkedIn. And my whole thing right now is radical, weird networking. So that works for me. Right. But I couldn't have just been like, well, I'm going to post about Keisha's birthday because it's Keisha's birthday. Yeah, I could send her a text or call her for that. There are other Internet means as well. Right. And and so yeah. I think that that is so freaking important. And you use this word that I love and that I think about all the time. So I really want to get your take on it. Rachel, you said unlearning and and more and more. I look at ethics. In marketing and sales as an, an unlearning. Right. And unlearning of things that have been forced upon us or things that we have kind of picked up along the way or an unlearning of industry standards and best practices that aren't best for us. What What is your relationship with unlearning, especially in this ethical marketing space? I love that you've asked this question because I know this word unlearning is used a lot and probably like overused at this point um like pivot during the what pandemic. word is it unused I mean come on I said authenticity True. 976 times today what word is it overused I, I know um so I suppose my relationship you're so right like that's what I think I've been struggling with I'm going to be honest I always didn't love a lot of the ways in which businesses, I'm going to talk about businesses specifically, both large Mm -hmm. corporations, small businesses, did their marketing. I've been in this industry since I was 19, managing teams and doing work since I was 19. I've lived different parts of the world, you know, from like London um, to, you know, Dhaka and Bangladesh. I've worked for all different companies. I've been manager. I've run my own business, you know, did the freelancer thing. You know, I've been running my own business for 10 years. And the entire time, Something didn't feel quite right, but I never had the words to explain it or I never had the resources to draw upon that I do now. And I think for many of us, again, if we stop looking externally and look internally, we would know that we didn't feel 100% because we'd get things sold to us, you know, whether it's like steak knives or a $1,000 course and perhaps it wasn't quite right, you know, you'd get the buyer's remorse and there were words for that, but I don't think it really went into both the sort of intention in the sales process, what the person was trying to get out of it and the result. I feel like it was just focused on the result. If you made money and the person has got a product and it's, you know, it's meant to help them, then tick, tick, we're all happy. But if you feel gross selling those steak knives and the person who gets the steak knives goes home and, you know, goes, actually, that doesn't look good with the rest of my, you know, dinner set, or I don't like how it cuts my steak. 
then then was it successful? And then obviously ethics is, you know, over the top of that. But I think for a while there, I was like, this doesn't feel right. And there were moments in my career where I was like, I'm not doing that. And the ethics were really, really clear. I worked for not for profits and, you know, they wanted to put like another little brown girl with bright blue eyes on the front of an ad to sell it to white people. And I was like, this is gross. The fact that we're specifically choosing certain things. And yes, you do need to take some consideration to like what's going to work, what's not, right? But it was just so unethical in the way they were talking about it and how much money they were going to make. And I was like, have you lost the sight of the fact that we're helping a community get water? Like, hello, and no one gave mm-hmm. a shit. And I was like, this is clearly unethical now. Like, And so I refused to post things, do things, didn't stay in that job for very long. Um, I was kindly asked to leave when my contract ended. I wonder why. Um, but it wasn't <laughs> until kind of recently, right, that I was like, I mm-hmm. have words and there are more people like me, just other human beings and other experts and peers being like, no, something's got to give and there's something to be ways for us to, like I said, draw upon research and understanding and we have words. And I think now I can say I don't like what's happening or this doesn't feel good and I can actually go through it in my brain. The things I've been taught versus how I feel plus ideas. I'm like, oh, this may be why this doesn't feel good in this moment. If I don't feel good, then my clients and customers don't feel good, which means others in the industry don't feel good. Hang on, we need to talk about something here. So I think it is a lot of unlearning because I'm so programmed and we all are. Like we're literally living in a capitalist world that sells us shit all the time. And if you have resources, access to resources, that is that means you're an amazing human being. And if you don't, well, you know, you just got to work harder which yeah. that narrative in itself is so annoying. So I think there is a lot of unlearning. Yeah. And when you're like swimming in that kind of ocean all day, how do you tell that you're in that ocean? All you know is that ocean. So I think, yeah, unlearning is the perfect way to describe kind of how I'm figuring it out. And I don't have the answers. And again, I think that is important for us in marketing where we're meant to have the answers and business owners were meant to look like we, again, have the answers. We know our shit and I'm, proudly saying yes I know stuff but for once I don't know everything and I'm totally happy to say that and actually be like who wants to come on the journey with me and who wants to unlearn with me and who wants to do peer-to-peer learning now more than ever and I think that kind of peer-to-peer learning allows us to override some of the capitalism and some of these really like binary for and against kind of statements and things that no longer feel true to any of us and probably never did. Yeah, and probably never freaking did. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. You know, one thing that you said there made me think a lot about the the definition I heard recently of expertise. And it said that experts are not the people who know the most in the room. The experts are the ones who are most willing to figure it out. And that made me think a lot about when I legitimately have to say, I don't know to my clients. And back in the early years of my career, and I don't know, felt horrible. It felt like I was slapping my client right across the face. They came to me for help and, oh, my lazy ass doesn't know. My imposter syndrome ass doesn't know. I don't know. I can't say I don't know. But now... That's totally changed. I treat that, I treat myself with kindness. I'm much more aware of my lane. And if something is in my lane and I don't know, I get curious about it. And I include my client in that curiosity, right? Sometimes if they ask me something that's totally outside my lane, I'm like, wow, that's really fascinating. Not my lane. Let's look into it together. But I recommend that you go seek out somebody. I recommend blah, 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 or this YouTube channel or whatever, right? But sometimes if it is in my lane and someone's like, I have this problem and I don't know how to solve it, then I go, you know what? I don't know. Here's the experiment I'm going to do. I'm going to report back to you in six days and we're going to figure out what our next step is based on my findings. And they love that. They love that. My clients aren't mad about that. I'm going out and honing my expertise for them because they know it that where I am on the learning curve and where I am as an expert, I will be able to experiment, distill, and translate 
infinitely faster than them. So that I know, I don't know now, it's just buying me time to figure it out, right? But again, it's that validation. It's like, what does it mean if I say I don't know when I'm serving my clients? Oh, ooh, it's anti-validation. It means that I don't know, right? It's the same thing as getting a hater. No, it's freaking not. No, it's not. It's it's a call to do more. I love that you've brought that up, this idea of expertise, because it's something, it's a topic that I also speak to a lot. And I think the more that I speak to separately, this idea of expertise, what a leader is um, and everything you've shared here and ethical marketing, I realized the two for a lot of business owners, and I can't obviously speak to all industries. I'm not a researcher in this area, but from what I'm seeing and experiencing, these two are very interlinked because there's this narrative that as a business owner, you should know more than your clients and you should know everything compared to your customers. You are on like a pedestal, like you are above them and, you know, you share down to them. That is the traditional idea of like leadership and business, right, from the CEOs. And let's be honest, we still to this day take a lot of shit from traditional businesses, bring it into the online space and just call it something different or put a pink logo on it. And we say, oh, it's for small businesses. It's the same <laughs> stuff, right? Let's like, let's be real. I'm going to be honest. I'm guilty of this. We are all are. Like we're taking stuff from our expertise, from our day jobs in. So that sort of idea of leadership and big business has been brought into small business, which allows us to do things like fake it till you make it. Never say you don't know what the answer is, which is the beautiful example, Annie. I'm glad you shared that. And we have all of these feelings come up around that, like, but I have to know, but my clients won't pay me again if I don't know. You know, I'm a terrible business owner if I can't X. And then this often, in my opinion, you know, I'm doing all these weird hand movements, but you know, it's on the left, my left fist and the right sort of fist is ethical marketing. This like little rainbow, this little like shit storm attaches. And then we start doing eth- unethical marketing tactics because yeah. we need to get authority quicker because we need authority for our clients to know, like, and trust us. We start doing unethical tactics or we want to be seen as a leader. So we start making really for and against statements, even if we don't truly believe them so that we can like sell and it makes the message easier and sexier. And then, you know, we start talking about certain wins without talking about, which you said the word before, Annie, and I love that, you know, the nuance behind how we did something, it comes back to that ethical marketing just yep. because I was able to get a result. It's also how I got the result, but we don't care because again, it works really well for selling in that program and selling those tangible and intangible results, which we're told to do. And I'm, and I'm seeing this as like the expert the person who is experiencing this, the person who is teaching this. And I can just see how they're related more and more. This need to be like right and best and above others is causing a lot of these unethical marketing kind of decisions because the tactics and and strategy themselves often aren't ethical. And often the person, I'm going to say most people are general generally great humans and they're not intentionally trying to be unethical but then all of this other stuff on top. And again, you're swimming in that ocean. You don't know that because you're just getting taught that. You see it shared back to you. It's reinforced all of that external validation. And then you wake up and then like me, you have this crisis being like, oh, it's all too hard. My brain explodes because I'm trying to compute all of these different things. And that's why I'm, again, like looking at unlearning and wanting to do more peer-to-peer teaching. Like my clients and community know themselves, their business, their goals, their values, their ethics, what they want to achieve, how they want better than me or anyone else. And that I think is a radical concept in the business space. It doesn't sound it when you say it by itself, but it is when oh, it, it underpins is. everything else. So I'm not going to tell them they need to buy my program. They can do X, Y, and Z. Mine is like an, you know, an opportunity or one example. I'm not going to tell them they need to do it my way or a certain way. Particularly a lot of my clients are neurodiverse, come from various backgrounds. A lot of these traditional approaches never work for them and it's never going to work for them. And sometimes they even say to me, Hey, Rach, that really isn't working for me. And like you said, Annie, I go, okay, great. Like, what would you like to try? What's feeling good? And then I'll test things out exactly like you, Annie, and share it back and be like, that's, it's not my approach. It doesn't feel good to me, but let me know if this feels good to you. Here's why it might still be valid. So just believing that my clients know best 
that allows me to do ethical marketing because ethical marketing is assuming that our clients and customers don't know best. We know best. Yes. We know what their problems are. We know what they're thinking. We know what their desires are. We know what their life looks like. We know. We're the expert. We're on that pedestal. We're the the expert. Yeah. And so I think those two go so so well to like together and hearing you say that is really starting to help me like articulate so I'm literally just riffing live for the first time with everyone here on this but it's been something I've been thinking about like they go so well together right I mean well here's the thing is is you you and I our work we talked about this in the pre-chat your work and my work are so aligned and and this is just a really great call to everyone to go talk to someone else in your space because the way you're articulating things, especially as you're doing, like you said, you're just like figuring it out as you say it. It's so refreshing for me to hear it because you're talking about stuff. I talk about it all the time from a totally different angle that I've never heard before. I know they've never heard it before because I haven't said it. So like, what? Right? It's blowing my mind. Yay. But one of the things that you're talking about that I think is so freaking key, but I've never heard so clearly articulated in such a, you know, this or that way in this ethical or integrity or heart driven or whatever the hell you want to call it space is the peer led versus guru led. Right. And so you said, I want to do my work peer led. And the people that come to me know their business better than I do. They know themselves better than I do. And I want to honor that knowledge. That is revolutionary when the majority of the time, especially in how some programs are sold, it's like, you will never make a dime if you don't do this program. I am the way. I am the pathway. If you don't go through me, you're not getting there, you idiot. So you may as well sign up to be groupie number 912. That is guru, hero, worship, hierarchical crap. But you had made a previous point that started this that I was like, oh, holy shit. She's totally right. That is bringing corporate, big business, hierarchy, organization chart thinking into small business, whereas small business has always been the business of community. It's always been neighbors promoting neighbors. It just so happens that our selling space is global now, right? But that hierarchical guru must do what the boss says because the boss knows better, have to sign up and punch my card and put in my dues and, you know, follow the orders and follow the rules because this person is better than me. That's just straight up organization chart. That's just management, right? We don't need to be the managers of our clients in the way that we're better than them. If anything, there are managers. We are here to support them. But if so, then we're just reinforcing hierarchy again. Why can't we all just be on the same level? Why can't we just treat know, everybody right? like we're on the same level? Why can't we just treat our clients like our peers? We can. And I think we do. We sh- I think we should. And I'd like to think, and, you know, if any of my clients are listening, maybe they'll let us uh, know later on. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think that I do lead like that. And, again, that's something, you know, coming back to what I was saying, like I always felt – something was quite off in the corporate space and it was why I moved is because I wanted to lead in this way. And I have been a manager. I have led in traditional things from, you know, in a retail store with clothing to, um, you know, like in corporate spaces to like not-for-profits. Like I have led in so many places. And like I said, I've been leading teams um, from I was 19 in a more corporate sense, but I've been leading teams since I was like 16. So for me, in that leadership role and in all of these different sort of work environments, it Mm -hmm. really is like, why can't we just lead in this way? And I remember learning that I can still literally picture the diagram in like my business book. I wish I had it. I could probably Google it. And it's literally showing, you know, the organizational chart and things like that. And I know this is years ago when I was studying like, you know, 2006 or seven or something, then they were talking about, you know, we want to have more of this PR kind of model. I think they called it something else, you know, like a less hierarchical. And they're pretty much like, nah, it doesn't work. And I was like, why doesn't it work? Because you want to scale to the point that we're saying to scale or to have more people in our program, to make more money. Because, you know, this is why 
ethical marketing ethic is coming up because we're realizing we can actually have a really sustainable, profitable income and be a decent human being and take care of the environment and community in the right way is that we are, have brought again, brought that in saying, if I want to have X, Y, and Z in my business and life, I need to scale, I need to do X. And therefore, you know, this whole kind of ethical marketing chart and program that I could follow, oh, it's not going to work for me. And it's like, hang on, again, we're just bringing it straight back from the corporate and we're falling into the same thing again, but just a different kind of like bow on top, you know, some confetti and some champagne. And we're saying this is, you know, for women and all women. No, like this is just the usual thing. And I'm saying this as someone who's also, again, participating in this space in capitalism, you know, we are in this world, we can't expect individual business owners to change everything, that is a huge responsibility that I think a lot of us are feeling like we need to take on, which I don't think is fair. But generally speaking, I've had a very successful business and I know you have and many have as well and mm-hmm. in various types of success through throwing out all of this and saying, even if it takes me longer, even if I have to know everyone on my freaking team and pay them well, like even if I have to spend more time crafting messages and considering others and talking to others and doing training is actually going to benefit me in the long term. And people, again, just want that quick wing, like that CEO yes. just wants to make sure that shareholders have that money and is willing to do anything. Again, that to me just allows for so much more to come up and for you to justify it. I can't scale unless I hire six people from the Philippines, which yeah, we hear all the I, time. I can't scale unless I completely neglect my clients. What? Like, yes, that's a what? huge one right now. What? Like, and I'm not, I'm not dogging automation. I love automation. Automation yeah. is important. We hear all the time about the relationship between automation and scale. And that is because automation reduces time waste. Big deal. Big freaking yeah. deal. However, automation like AI is meant to replace humans. We should not be replacing humans in our client work our client work is what makes us special, right? So it's not that we can't have hands-off stuff. If your program is really robust, that's great. But what I see more and more is people rushing to do things like certify middle coaches or, you know, get that one-to-many money where they can spend one second with a hundred people instead of doing that one-to-one. And and, uh, other Rachel, recent, Rachel K. Albers was on the show And she was real up in arms about this because she was like, look, expertise, which we were talking about before, is built one to one to one to one to one. I have people all the time that are like, I can't freaking wait to hire a sales team. And I'm like, the last thing on earth that I want you to do right now is hire a sales team. You have no idea what your clients want. You have no idea what their objections are, at least not on a deep level. You haven't had to get in there and negotiate. You don't know how they're going to respond to your prices. You haven't done a competitive analysis. By all means, a middleman is not going to fix the fact that you don't want to do sales calls, right? Like if you don't want to do sales (laughs) calls... I'm I'm sorry, then don't be in business, right? Like let yeah. let someone like Rachel or me help you. We will help you figure out how to do it, right? But at the same point, that's one of the main things I hear people are like, oh, I just can't wait until I make, you know, my second 10K month because the first thing I'm gonna do is hire a sales team. And I'm like, that right there is the kiss of death. It's not even a missed opportunity, it's the kiss of death, but we're focused on that scaling mentality when it's like, but what if we scale with intention? Yes, it might be slower to your previous point, but it'll also be longer lasting because you'll be basing it on real research, data, experience, and actual earned expertise. Yeah. Imagine that. Yes. Like mic drop. And it's funny that you sort of bring that up. So I agree with Rachel K too. And I was listening to her like episode with you and something I talk about a lot. And recently I actually, in September of 2021, I have to remember what year it was, 2021, I retired all of my programs, courses, and instead doubled down on a one-on-one program. So I now offer only one program, a six month work with me one-on-one and 
that in itself felt really radical and scary because everyone normally at our level of expertise, right, and, you know, experience and in business is doing everything else and teaching everything else. And here I was being like, hang on, I'm going to do what feels good to me, what gets my clients the best results, and it's still scalable. I can still make the income I want. I can still do other opportunities. I can still have time off, you know, all the, you know, freedom, money, tick, tick, tick. But do you know why I also did it? And I haven't shared this anywhere before is because it felt more ethical and it felt more aligned to me. And that's a separate thing with my values and how I want to run my business and how I like to coach and everything. But it felt more ethical because I could focus truly and deeply on my clients. I wasn't in a constant sales cycle and and I was still loving hard on my clients. Don't get me wrong. I am a natural over deliverer. But in these programs, I would sell them, then be delivering them while selling the next one. And, and I was, and all I was ever thinking about was like the next kind of sales cycle and I'll be having like sales conversations and then, you know, like having a quick cup of tea so then I can go back and try to switch my mindset to go work with my clients, switch my mindset to like get on podcasts. And again, with my personality and the way I like to work, it also wasn't good. And I want to make that clear that it's a very personal choice as well, but it also helped me with my ethics. I was like, I've never felt more ethical in my business, being able to focus only on them, improving my expertise, doing the things I love, um, you know, not having to be taking on a whole bunch of tactics, not feeling like I was doing more and more of these, I'm going to say quote unquote, like unethical tactics that we see, you know, countdown timers and 60 emails on the last day of, you know, the email. I never did that. But, you know, the three and all the things we're taught that work, well, Actually, they never really particularly worked well for me. And then I started testing things out recently. And I love that you brought up testing with the still kind of same strategy of launching and selling because there is a strategy and it does work. And then the tactics do work themselves. Remember, they're not unethical. It's the way that we use them and our intention and the results we get. And I started playing around with headlines and button texts and all of that and just writing from the heart. And it followed the structure that I know to be true, but it also felt like me in the moment. And I was really serving my clients. And guess what? It worked. I like saw, like sent one email, literally changed my mind on Thursday evening, switched out everything, knew I was closing out my program, sent an email to past clients, potential clients on like the Friday morning. And then I filled up my coaching program within like 72 hours. I sent one email, a couple of DMs, and then I did it twice more, a couple of weeks later with more spots. And it wasn't, it wasn't ridiculously huge strategies. It wasn't doing all of these things that we've been told. It was literally me reaching out to other human beings, like a human being, like, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I want to help you this way. It was just so simple. And again, like I said, I keep saying strategy because it had the key messages. Like I would be lying if I said I didn't follow those because I did, I did follow what I knew to be true, all these things that we're taught, but I did it my way and it worked everyone it worked and I'm not saying it's going to work for you every time and it's worked perfectly for me every time again that's not true but it freaking worked and do you know what like I just sat there and I was stunned because again that that I didn't need that external validation I had that internal validation and yes that was the yes. case studies was like it makes sense to me I can be an expert I can do ethics and teach that I can support my clients I can do it my way and guess what it works so if you're listening to this being like I'm I'm scared I don't know gonna work because you validated your damn self yes yes I literally validated what I knew to be true this entire time that something wasn't right and I was like I'm just gonna you know listen to myself that little voice is like do it do it and you know what it happened to be correct so again it's something to consider with those voices which I know my clients have and I'm sure you have Annie and I'm sure your clients and community too those voices that we keep ignoring because of all of these unethical things that we're taught that we have to do that we simply do and each time it erodes trust and it erodes your own kind of self-belief like it did to me it really knocked me around and it wasn't until I kind of took back my own kind of power and listened to that voice that I was like oh my god I don't need I don't need all this bullshit I don't need all of this crap um, yep. I'm going to make it work. <sighs> I just keep like needing to remind myself to breathe because I'm so in love with this conversation and your magnificent brain. You know, before we transition into our ridiculous pop culture topic that you have brought for us today, <laughs> ridiculous. Um, I, I love what you said. So 
you know, I was talking about before about how aligned our work is. I get asked all the time because of the non-sleazy sales academy. I get asked all the time, what is my definition of sleazy versus non-sleazy? And my soundbite on that is always sleazy selling does not honor the person attached to the wallet and non-sleazy selling honors the human that's making the purchase or not. Right. I love that. And, and the way that you put it was human to human. Right. And so it's not just following what feels good. That is a big component, but sometimes all kinds of stuff can feel good. Validation can feel good. Right. So I love that question you asked, and I'm going to bring that back up of why am I posting this? But additionally, I love that beacon, that test that you've given us, which is very pass fail. Is this human to human? Am I showing up as a person, reaching out to a person? Maybe many people, but with the intention of helping reaching people within those people, right? And and so I think as we're wandering and doing all of this experimenting and learning to trust and unlearning and everything else, if we start to go, wow, am I really off the rails here? Am I too far off course? Then we just run it through the filter check of is this human to human? Oh, I absolutely adore that. That permission slip. Is this human to human? If yes, continue to follow what feels good. If no, remember why you're doing this and look for unlearning. My God, we've just, this is a whole freaking course, y'all. It's a thousand dollar course. I want to talk about this more. Sorry. Mm -hmm. We can talk about this for days, obviously. We could. uh, We could. But I brought you here (laughs) under other circumstances. And the other circumstances is (laughs) Rachel, my new BFF. What in the actual crap does any of this have to do with another of America's beloved rich children show? The OC. I am so glad you asked this question, Annie. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about this previously, obviously. Um, sorry. <laughs> I think it's actually a perfect analogy of the small business space. Why? Okay. So many reasons. But Ryan is out there in the world. His life is not going well. You know, he has what we call the, you know, the normally picturesque, like this is, he's in his white, you know, white, white beef up, tank top, you know, the jeans, the car, you know, he's making all the wrong decisions. He's getting pulled along. It's not really him though. It's his brother. And then like Sandy Cohen comes and saves him and brings him into this new world. And this world is like meant to be better. It's like shinier. It's nicer. He has to navigate that. Will he fit? oh, wait, all of the crap he was running away from literally in that car ends up being in his life from Mm -hmm. a mother figure who is experiencing, you know, alcoholism, who's drinking too much, um, you know, who isn't herself and not able to make great decisions, take care of him, from like other drugs and alcohol to, you know, like the father figures stealing money. Like, and what I think is perfect analogy is a business space because you're like, oh, I'm going to leave the corporate world and come into the business space because it's going to be like new, shiny, better. No. And then also with these programs, these celebrity entrepreneurs, we're waiting for them to come save us, to take us from our world of 2K months, not 10K months and, you know, a certain car or whatever. We're literally waiting for them to come save us and show us this new world, take us to this new place and new experience will come out better in you with more opportunities. But often it's it's all the crap inside these programs that affect us They're telling us we're not good enough, we don't know enough, all of these things. So I think there are so many, obviously I've been thinking about this a lot in the shower, so many <laughs> analogies from <laughs> the online, like, business space and corporate, everything we've been talking about today. And I think it it goes to show that we have a really interesting and old narrative of what it means to be like poor or without or, um, and also like rich, you know, like what it looks like and feels like to be like rich and privileged and all that. And in the end, we're all just like freaking humans walking around with labels again in the same school or the same, like, you know, the OC, the same world dealing with the same crap. We just put different labels or 
you know, put on a pair of like glasses, Chanel glasses and think the world's going to look different. It's not. So again, you can't be Ryan hoping someone's going to save you. You literally need to have your own values and ethics. And he does throughout the show. Occasionally he goes and like punches people up. But that is, again, a really bad <laughs> use of, uh, trying to show you how he's trying to deal. But he does. Like he knows like Oliver in the first season, even though Oliver's like the rich kid that, you know, he's dangerous for Marissa and no one believes Ryan because of his past experience and who he is and what he looks like, but they believe Oliver. And Oliver is the one who needs help mm. and needs to be taken care of. So there's so many analogies in that that I think we can draw upon. I feel like there's also something to be said about the shiny high ticket client and the normal low ticket client, right? Because yeah, the rich people are just as screwed up, if not more. They're, maybe they're hiding it better. Maybe they're just wearing nicer shoes. Who knows, right? But there is this idea of like, I'm going to get a premium client and then my life is going to be incredible and no one's going to be like, okay, but a premium client can be just as big of a pain in the ass, if not more than a non-premium client. If you're vetting on how much somebody will pay you exclusively, you're probably going to find some jerks that way. Not that there aren't jerks with no money. Of course there are, but... You know, if if we're only looking at somebody's demographic information and we're ranking them in that way, ooh, this person's rich. Ooh, they're going to be a great client. Okay, well, maybe, maybe not, maybe not, right? Or, you know, this person came in at my low ticket offer. This person came in at my high ticket mastermind. Uh, I'm not going to nurture this low ticket lead because they're never going to turn into anything. You don't freaking know that. You don't know that. Right. And, and why don't you want to be the person if it's right for you? Not that we have to go around saving people. Cause that's a whole other thing, especially for white people, but you know, we don't need to run around saving everybody, but at the end of the day, why can't we recognize greatness in the people that everybody else ignores? Right. Exactly. Like the OC is a lot about people getting ignored that you wouldn't expect to get ignored. But it's really about who you shower your attention on and, and the nurturing of that attention. Again, in a way that I never really thought about. I'm not like, oh, yes, this is a show about com- creating community and nurturing. I was like, she's doing what now? Marissa's doing what now? <laughs> what is this? Who? Team Oliver, what? Like, I wasn't paying attention to any of this. But you're right. It really is a powerful allegory about hierarchy. Again, the hierarchy we put on things and where we place ourselves. Are we putting ourselves at the top of that list unnecessarily? Are we putting ourselves at the bottom of the list unnecessarily? And why are we even ranking people in the first place? I know all of the judgments we place on everything in business from the experts we hire to our clients to the type, like for a while there, you know, it was all about courses and now it's all about like, you know, masterminds. And again, we put all these emphasis on certain programs at certain times. And I just, I've always found it like fascinating why we do this. Because again, if you truly stick to like what feels good for you, aligns your ethics, your values, all of the foundational stuff that no one wants to do, right? then you'll know what works for you and it will always be cool or trendy to you and your clients no matter what's help like happening externally. And I think something to take away from this kind of conversation is that you can't pay someone to do the ethics or to do the foundational work or the thinking or to get stuff out of your brain. Like you can't pay someone to do that. I wish I could. I mean, yes, you can go to therapy. I go to therapy, can help you understand yourself. You know, yes, you can have a business coach. I have a business coach who supports me with tactics and thinking and different answers and can share back with me what they're hearing if I have fears or, you know, what's working well. But I, I have to do that work with both of them. I can't, I can't pay someone to do that. And I think, Again, it comes down to, you know, the OC, like this idea of wanting to like pay, pay, everyone was trying to pay each other off or have someone else take the blame or to do the work or they only want to do a little bit here and a little bit there and still get all of the recognition and still live the beautiful lifestyle and a lot of like turning a blind eye to certain things that weren't working. And again, it shows us as human beings how we love to do that. We're not perfect. We, We do avoid things that are hard and difficult and 
it's also a lifelong journey. Like you don't go, this is my ethics and values and then it never changes. A lot of the time mm-hmm. it will tweak slightly or you'll pull on, draw upon one more than the other, but that kind of work you just need to do. And like for me, this idea of self-awareness and honesty and authenticity have are personal values and I've really used them in the business. But again, a lot of the values, if I ask clients for business, it's like doing good, which is great value, but then they can't express how that looks in their business. So like you say, coming back to the clients and then you break yeah. it down. It's like, well, you think that that client won't give you as much money. So therefore you're going to do X, even though your values are saying this, like, how does that work? And also most of my clients have come to a free workshop, listen to the podcast episode or pay for one of my lower priced, um, you know, classes or whatever. And guess what? Mm-hmm. Like I have like 70 or 80% rate right, where they come and work with me. And it could be two weeks later or it could be two years later and that is okay. And I know that's going to happen and I respect that that's going to take some time. But again, this idea that I'm meant to, someone's meant to move through all of my programs and within six months have done them all. And then what? And then I go, bye. And then go get the next lot of people to take them through. Like, where does that make sense to me? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't make a damn bit of sense. People like Chanel handbags that you put on when you want to look good for a certain point in your life. And then you put it in your cupboard and you get given another one. Like they're not Chanel handbags coming back to the OC. Like, yeah, please stop. Please stop. But I love and I would be absolutely remiss if I did not call out the soundbite you said again, because it's absolutely brilliant. And I think encapsulates everything that we've talked about today. You can't pay someone else to ethics for you. You can't. That is not a corner you can cut. And you are only as ethical as a business as your least ethical team member. It, it pulls everybody's right. average down, right? But you just simply cannot, right? Sandy bringing Ryan in does not undo his crimes. His one act of, you know, not that bringing in a foster kid is, is one small act. I'm not saying that, y'all. Don't at me. But, you know, it, it doesn't negate the fact that he was doing other nefarious things. You can't have one good action replace a bad action and you can't have someone else ethics for you. Ryan being redeemed does not also redeem Sandy. Dang, we are getting deep today. All right, Rachel, I got two more questions for you and then I promise I will let you go. Start your beautiful day over there in Australia. My first question for you is, now, we're grown ass women and we're grown ass business women running good businesses. But let's just say that there's a brand new thing that takes the world by storm where celebrities adopt adult business women. Uh, so I know you have a parent. Today is actually the celebration of your mom's birthday. But let's imagine for a second that you were going to go out and get adopted by a celebrity. Which celebrity would you want to adopt you and why? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> my my first thought was Jennifer Aniston because really? she's beautiful, has had an amazing career and hasn't done everything conventionally. She's also obviously a very privileged um, woman now, so I want to acknowledge that. She can come save me any day yep. um yep. but yeah I just love how she like her, her standing stuff and I was re-watching one of her movies and like a day ago which is probably why I'm also thinking of her and I thought she's such a good actress she does like comedy and like mm-hmm. drama and she did the television show and she's also stayed kind of true to herself like her hair is pretty much the same all the time and her voice like she yep. hasn't had to change a lot and I was like wouldn't that be nice to like just be me do what I do and people to love me for it so she could just Tell me how she gets her hair so like just so Perfect. shiny, Silky and then also and how, gorgeous. yeah, and how to have like such a gorgeous house, and how to like still be like kicking goals where she is in her career and her like age and things like that, where a lot of people are kind of told to move on and do different roles. She's still playing like the really mm-hmm. strong female, gorgeous lead, and there's a there's rare that that is allowed in Hollywood, yeah. and so. I want to learn her her secrets. I'm sure she has. Many. I love that. 
She does seem grounded as hell. Plus, as TV's most famous Rachel of all time, then you could just call your new combined home the Rachels. You could just be <gasps> the Rachels. I think Jen would be into that. I think she'd be totally fine with that, actually. Definitely. But I used, going, to, I used to have the right haircut too. So I feel like I could hang out with her and just blend right Didn't in. we all? I mean, like, didn't we all? I kind of have the Rachel now. The Rachel will never die. And neither will my love for you, Rachel. So if our <laughs> listeners, uh, if, not if, because our listeners are raving to hear more from you, I'm certain of it. What is the best way for them to start a conversation with you? I am huge on Instagram and DM. So I chat a lot about plants, dogs, business, marketing. So if you're the type of person who loves to like have a voice message chat, DM chat, you can hit me up there. If you prefer to like listen while you're doing activities and get to know me and some of the things that I teach and do, then I recommend hanging out with me on my podcast, The Rachel Kujip Show, where I'm talking about amazing things like Annie and having really amazing guest experts who are really open and honest and sharing all of their kind of knowledge and skills for free. And they're also really short episodes, normally five or so minutes with me and you can do the thing, um, listen to it and go do the thing or um, the interviews, which again are really practical and only like 20 to 30 minutes. So I know not all of us have long amounts of time or energy to spend like in the DMs on podcasts. So you can sort of pick your own adventure as Annie um, said at the, before we started recording. I love that analogy <laughs> and I think it's true. You can hang out with me and talk to me however you like. And of course, if you're interested in learning more about the one-on-one coaching program and how to support my clients in that space to pretty much do all the things that Annie and I have been talking about. If you want to basically hang out with me and have these types of conversations, then you can also talk to me about those in the DMs. I freaking love it. But everybody remember, keep those DMs human to human. Rachel, this has been such a soothing conversation for my soul. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Thank you so much for having me and for allowing me to share my ideas with you. I hope that people will get a lot of value from them. Oh, they will. You will, right, listeners? Just kidding. Everybody, I will be back in just a second with my final thought and your homework for the week. Maybe take the second to go and get some water. Well, hey there. Does anybody else remember the scene from the end of Billy Madison where Adam Sandler and Bradley Whitford's characters discuss business ethics. I'm pretty sure that's the first time I ever heard that term, and I could understand it clearly due to the context. Bradley Whitford's character is a sleazeball, manipulative, selfish, greedy, conniving, only in it for himself. Answering a question about ethics is meant to stump him. It's just about the worst outcome imaginable for him. And therefore, I deduced way back in 1995 at the ripe old age of 11 that ethics simply must be the act and art of treating people with fairness and decency. That's still pretty much my definition now. What has your relationship with the idea of ethics been? How do you determine what is ethical and what isn't? And how do other people's opinions or tactics or morality knock you off course? This week's homework has three parts. Don't groan. Last week, you got a permission slip and the previous week was just an ask. So here we go. Number one. First, I want you to identify your three core values. Namely, when you're operating human to human, how do you want to treat that human? How do you require yourself to be treated in turn? Number two, then, and do not skip this critical step, make a list of all the ways you're currently showing and using that value in your business. Is it infused in your copy? your standard operating procedures, your curriculum. Three, finally, fill in the gaps by assigning real, tangible marketing and admin tasks to living each of your values. Remember, a commitment without action is just empty words. So let's get out there and make things better and make money simultaneously. The world needs your light. 
So let's get you out there so you can spread it ethically. Hey, thanks for listening. Too Legitimate to Quit is brought to you by the non sleazy Sales Academy and me, your host, Annie P. Ruggles. Listen, we talk a lot about marketing on this show, and that's because I fully, earnestly believe that every dime and every moment we spend marketing is totally worth it unless we turn around and sabotage ourselves at the finish by refusing to sell and sell beautifully. Why? A lot of us have a misconception of what selling actually requires of us or who it needs us to be. Please give me the opportunity to help change your mind at www.nonsleazy.com. That's N-O-N-S-L-E-A-Z-Y.com. Big shout out to the fabulous dudes who helped make this show what it is. My producer and editor, Andrew Sims of Hypable Impact my composer, Riley Herbastio, and my show artist, Francois Vigneault. They're all fabulous, and I'd be glad to introduce you. Until next week, just do your best, and remember, you're too legitimate to quit.